Hey YouTubers, it's me, Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. I'm going to be completing this reading. I'm, I'm not going to be completing it. I'll read for about 15-20 minutes. Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years, Oral History of Dr. John W. Goffman, MD, PhD, conducted December 20th, 1994, United States Department of Energy, Office of Human Radiation Experiments, June 1995. So I think here that I'm actually officially obsessed with getting these readings out because I should be working right now, but I'm not. So um, that is part of the reason why sometimes it takes me longer to get back to you because, you know, I don't have a sugar daddy and I need to support myself. So, And I wasn't born with a spoon in my mouth, so I get to earn my keep. So we are on this uh, paragraph where Dr. John Goffman was talking about what was going on with um, the Lawrence Livermore lab and John Lawrence and how they were trying to sabotage it. So let me continue on this. I stopped in the mid-sentence mid with him, mid-paragraph. Um, I don't know if I did anything more about the John Lawrence thing. There were some underhanded things, actually some efforts to try to destroy the division, which was the reason I went to see Mrs. Hurst. I asked her to set up an event honoring John Lawrence, which she did. The Regents sponsored a dinner and made a big to-do about the Donner Laboratories and all the good things that were done there. It was just kind of a slap in the face to the medical center, which was not being very nice. Hefner. Was there anybody else trying to destroy Goffman in Berkeley? Yes, in Berkeley, asked Hefner. Goffman. Yes, that was a lot later. Some of the biologists there didn't particularly like the division of medical physics. In the reorganization, it was shifted to the molecular and cell biology thing. The division of medical physics became a department then was abolished in the biological reorganization. I think there was a lot of arrogance on the part of some of the people in molecular biology. They thought they were the greatest thing since the wheel and everything else didn't matter. I think they considered some of the ongoings as to why Berkeley Rad Lab should not work on heart disease. Just offshoots of our work and it's gotten to be rather well accepted. But I think that too, I think that to some of the molecular biologists, this is before they grew up, they regarded this as too practical and therefore of no interest to the great campus with fundamental science. You get stupidity on campuses sometimes that has no equal and sometimes equals most of the stupidity elsewhere. Nothing secret. I'll tell them that too. Well, well, I think I have told them that. I sort of, when I was at the junior college, I got put on administrative watch because I lost my temper at them and told them they were stupid. <laughs> so I think that still goes on. Okay, Hefner. On the off chance, do you know anything about experiments conducted by Will Seary or any of the Sam or any or others on the San Francisco 49ers, the whole blood volume study? I didn't know anything about that. Okay, Goffman. I do know this. Will Surrey was at the lab when I joined the lab in 1947. He was an extremely bright guy. He wrote the first book on applications of tracers in biology. He was working for his PhD and I was on his PhD committee. He could not take an oral examination. He simply blocked completely. We talked to him and said, look, maybe we can do it in writing. He refused. He never got the Ph.D. degree. He was helping John Lawrence with all their work with radioactive iron and iron metabolism. That's all I know about. John was so interesting. John was so interested in polycythemia, Vera, the disease he successfully treated with radiophosphorus. It's a disease of too many red blood cells. They were interested in that and altitude effects in other continents. I think Will went with John Lawrence down to South America in connection with some of that. I never knew the details except that it had a, that I had a very high respect for Surrey, and I still do. 
I tried like hell to make some progress with him to get his Ph.D. He just could not stand examinations. Having written the first book on radioactivity and applications of artificial radioactivity, you'd ask him a question on his exam and he couldn't answer. The guy obviously was one of the world's experts. That's all I knew about him. Okay, new subtitle. Radio Phosphorus Therapy for Polycythemia Vera. Given what you know, your social and political sensitivities, are any experiments from that 1950 era, the radioactive iron, the treatment of breast cancer, radio phosphorus, are there any of those experiments which you say to yourself, that was a little in the gray area? Goffman. Well, let's take the radio phosphorus first. I made some radioactive nuclides of E tritium, that's Y-T-T-R-I-U-M, that we tested in John's clinic. Nobody came to that clinic, to my knowledge, came as an experimental subject without knowing. Let me read that sentence again. Nobody came to that clinic, to my knowledge, came as an experimental subject without knowing. These were people who had a serious disease, knew just what was being done, and wanted it. You may have heard of some criticism of John Lawrence's radiophosphorus therapy. Some people said he killed people. I think that's unfair and false. I will tell you what the situation was. The disorder was that John Lawrence's great success was polycythemia vera, which he treated with radiophosphorus. Treating those people with radiation was not a new idea. Radiation had been used to treat polycythemia for decades before John Lawrence came on the scene. But they used it either radium or x-rays. Now that's just a fact. So John thought, well, if these people are making too many red, red cells and radiophosphorus goes to the bone marrow and the spleen, organs involved in making red cells, Maybe it will work better, or at least as well as, external x-rays or radium. That's the history of it. So if anybody says that John Lawrence introduced radiation in the treatment of polycythemia vera, it's a falsehood, an out-and-out -out lie. John Lawrence was giving radiophosphorus, and it turned out to be a very good way of managing these people who would otherwise be treated elsewhere with x-rays or radium. Now, that was worrisome, however, with anyone either, with ra either treated with either radium or x-rays or John Lawrence's uh, 32 plutonium, was that at least some of the people with polycythemia vera after x years, where x could mean 5 or 10 or 15, went into a new phase of their disease where they became leukemic. Some of the critics of radiation treatment of polycythemia vera said radioactivity made them become leukemic. You think? Now we get into this thing of where Dr. Busby says he disagrees, right? So let's get back to the story. When I came to Berkeley and worked at John's Clinic for those first couple of years, with us in the clinic was a young doctor by the name of Robert Rosenthal. Robert Rosenthal's father, Nathan Rosenthal, was one of the great hematologists in this country in New York. When Robert was there with us, Nathan Rosenthal visited occasionally. One afternoon, I remember, John called us all together and we were going to talk about polycythemia vera and the con conversion to leukemia and this whole question of whether the radioactivity was causing the leukemia. Nathan Rosenthal, by that point, as one of the world's leading hematologists with about 40 years of experience, said, You know, I've treated polycythemia vera for over 40 years, or some number like that. He said, It doesn't matter what you do. One of the treatments at the time was vena puncturing with repeated bloodletting. Whatever you treat with them with, eventually, if they don't have a stroke from the polycythemia vera, 
If you can control that, if you can make them live longer without a stroke by cutting the red blood cells, they'll all end up with leukemia. It's not a damn thing to do with the treatment. John felt very much relieved by that. There were still people who were saying that the radiophosphorus killed, caused the leukemia. I don't know whether a decent study has yet been done to ascertain whether they're right or not. It's just as clear as crystal in my mind, and I am amazed that he said that they'll all end up with leukemia no matter what the treatment. New subtitle. Pre-1945 medical use of high dosage radiation. Gorley. What about some of the other tracers? Goffman. Iodine or iron? Gorley, yes. Goffman. Let me say that I've gotten a, a excuse me. Let me say I've gotten a lot clearer in my mind on this since February of this past year when the symposium of the AAAS came up. Nobody seemed to know what radiation, nobody seemed to know that radiation was the cause of breast cancer. So I've gone back and looked. The 1940s are not the interesting period with respect to human experimentation. Human experimentation started back in the tens and in even the zero zeros of this century with Rotogen's discovery. Every disease known to man became subject to treatment with X-rays or radium. X -rays or radium. I can tell you this because I've been in that dungeon of the UCSF library where all the pre-1960 volumes are day after day of this year and went through page by page in the American Journal of Rotinology. And that's Rotogen, R-O-E-N-T-G-E-N. Okay. I wanted to know the flavor of the times. I wanted to know what the radiologists were saying to each other in their meetings. I went through some 40 years of journals, page by page. You know, I can find things out by getting a bibliography, but I wanted to see what they were saying in their actual papers. You name the disease, any disease. You want to know whether asthma was treated with radiation? I'll show you the papers of Dr. Eugene Letty from the Mayo Clinic in the 20s and 30s. We've treated 200 people in the Mayo Clinic with x-rays. And then they decided to modify it. They treated another 250. And then the final study. We've treated 1,000 people with bronchial asthma with x-rays. You think every one of those people had a consent form? That was therapy. X-rays were, there, are, there was a radiology department in the Mayo Clinic. They did diagnostic and therapeutic work. Now, in the very earliest years of Rotogen's discovery of the X-ray and Curie's discovery of radium, they got into the medicine very quickly. It looked promising, but it was not limited to the theory of cancer with both X-rays and radium. That was only part of the story. Every disease you can think of, there is a paper. Let me just go through and get some of them. Uh, I think I'm going to stop. I don't know how you guys feel. Please put it into the notes if you think it's better for me to read for 15 or 20 minutes. I re read the other day uh, for 22 minutes, which I felt was probably too long. So I'm going to do another reading tonight. I'm going to get myself off to work. I'm going to do another reading before I hit the sack. And uh, so that will catch us up and we can keep going. So... Thanks for listening to this, and um, it's amazing to listen to how a scientist justifies human experimentation. I'm fascinated with that. So put your courage feet on you guys, and uh, I guess it's up to us that we're going to be the ones to, like, uh, save humanity, right? <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I think it's going to be... Uh, I don't know if we can save humanity, but guess what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing all I can to oppose these monsters and shut down the nuclear industry and demand that science find solutions to the harm they've already caused. So, put your courage feet on. Ciao.